Right, everybody, we at our last presentation, it's a rather long presentation, but it's, this is where all the excitement lies. So uh, let's uh, all put our hands together for Dr. Barry Clark. Now, now, Barry is well known to, to our trust, also to the, the ADZ, the Aquaculture Development Zone, and various other institutions in the bay and the surrounds of the bay. Uh, he's also well known because he got to Everest to the base camp. Am I right? You are indeed. But then he, the, the, the mountain said, no further for you. You're just too big to get onto this mountain. Okay, so let's look at what, where, where Barry comes from, what's happened to him. Barry has 32 years experience in marine biological research and consulting on coastal zone and marine issues. He has worked as a scientific researcher, lecturer and consultant and has experience in tropical, subtropical and temperate ecosystems. He is presently the director of the environmental consultancy firm uh, Anchor Environmental Consultants uh, and as a research associate with the University of Cape Town. As a consultant, has been, he has been concerned primarily with conservation planning, monitoring and assessment of human impacts on estuarine, rocky shore, sandy beach, mangrove, and coral reef ecosystems, as well as coastal and littoral zone processes, aquaculture and fisheries, a rather broad um, spectrum of aspects that he's been involved in. He is the author of 27 scientific publications uh, in Class A scientific journals, as well as numerous scientific reports and popular articles uh, in free press. Geographically, his main area of expertise is in Southern Africa. Now listen to this, his main expertise. Lesotho, Namibia, Mozambique, Tanzania, Seychelles, Mauritius and Angola. But he's also working and has experience elsewhere in Africa, the Republic of Congo, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, the Middle East and Europe, Azerbaijan, and Greenland. So he's traveled the world and he's larger than life and his presentation technique is amazing. Barry, welcome and we're looking forward to the state of the bay, to the current reality. You'll remember my little diagram? What is current reality? You're going to hear that now. Thanks, Andre. Good morning everyone and uh, thank you again. It's a great privilege to be here to talk to all of you again about the state of the bay, state of Saldana Bay and Langaban Lagoon. I have been uh, working on Saldana Bay and Langaban Lagoon for a very long time. One of my first uh, areas, areas or topics of study was here in Saldana as an undergrad student at the University of Cape Town. I started work here and I've basically never left. But without further ado, let me just talk to you about what we found in the last year and uh, our new insights that we've gained. Um, some of my introductory slides, you've probably, many of you are familiar with. Um, just briefly, the State of the Bay reporting system is an annual assessment of anthropogenic impacts on, the, on Solana Bay and Langaban Lagoon and an assessment of the ecological health of the system. Um, when we talk about anthropogenic impacts, we're talking about activities and discharges, human activities, that affect the health of the bay. And in terms of the ecosystem health, we're talking about both physical health, in other words, uh, uh, parameters like water quality, temperature, salinity, oxygen, the currents and waves that Jacques was talking about just now, but also groundwater inflow, which is very, very important to Langebein Lagoon in particular. We also look at concentrations of contaminants in the seawater, in the sediments, and also in the living organisms in the bay. And then obviously those uh, faunal and floral communities themselves, what they can tell us about how the state of the bay, how the health of the bay is changing. And we look at such a wide spectrum of indicators because they respond to different time scales. Some of them respond in very short time scales and hours to days, others are longer lived, and they, they, they respond over months, decadal or years or decadal cycles. So it's important to look at that full spectrum of indicators to understand how things are changing and why they're changing and where, we, where we're going to in the future. 
And then we always try and uh, make a simple uh, representation of how that health is changing. And we use those smiley faces on the left-hand side there. Natural being, this is what it was always like, and, and uh, natural, uh, no, no changes as a result of human activities through uh, a gradation of good, fair, and to poor, which is really, re we really don't want to be. Oops, I think I'm pushing buttons out of someone else's. Um, and poor is obviously the one we want to avoid. We want to be in the blue or the green categories there when we look at different aspects of the health of the bay. Um, health of the bay wouldn't be anything without the support of the financial support that the trust receives from the various industries and uh, agencies that are operating around the bay. These are, I think, all of them. I hope it's all of them. And big thank you to them. The trust is a voluntary organization. These, organi these agencies all make voluntary contributions to the trust to enable the research, the monitoring work that we do and other people do here in the Bay. So hugely, huge big thanks, certainly from my side, to all of these people for the contributions that they do make to the trust. Um, also, a lot of other people are providing us with data and information on the State of the Bay that we bring together in this State of the Bay uh, reporting system. We don't do all the work. It's, there's a lot of other agencies there. South African National Parks, you heard from uh, um, Alison this morning, and um, also heard from Jacques. I think the University of Stellenbosch is not on there. Sorry, Jacques. <laughs> Um, but yes, there are a lot of other agencies that are, are, are involved here in the Bay, sorry my headgear is falling off here, um, that do provide assistance with data and uh, information that we use in, in, in assessing and tracking the health of the Bay. Now I was chatting to my colleague Emily here on the way up and uh, I realized this is the 15th time that I'm standing here talking to some of you about the state of the health of the Bay, uh, the state of the Bay, the health of the Bay. And uh, many of you have heard me say the same thing every year, or at least many of the same things. And, but every year I do try and make an effort to kind of come up with a new angle or some new insights about the health of the Bay, just to keep you entertained. And uh, this year I thought about COVID and the impact that COVID had on the health of the Bay. And while fish don't catch COVID, they are influenced by human activities. And uh, our COVID changed human activities the world over, and those have played out in the state of the Bay over the last few years, and we've seen some quite dramatic changes in the Bay that are linked to COVID. So I thought for this year, I'm going to pick up on that little thread and speak to you about how COVID, the impacts of COVID have played out on the health of the Bay. And COVID, it affected human activity enormously. It, it affected our economy, the global economy, and that has had some quite interesting and significant effects on the health of the Bay. And Alison mentioned, or I think Sasanda mentioned earlier, that they saw increases in the number of fish in the lagoon, maybe potentially associated with that COVID. And uh, I'm gonna pick up on that theme and talk a little bit about COVID and uh, the health of the Bay, but I'm also gonna talk more broadly about other long-term, biggest picture stuff that we see changing in the Bay and how the health of the Bay is changing. Um, okay, so starting with the activities and the, the, the nasty bits first, the activities and the discharges in the Bay, um, we saw a significant slowdown in economic production activity, human activity in the Bay during the COVID years, the sort of 2018, 2019, 2020, I suppose mostly 2019, 2020. And there was a significant slowdown in the rated new projects that were coming on and board in the Bay. There was definitely a slowdown in the number of people that were, were here, a number of tourists, number of visitors. Um, but since that time, we've, COVID is very much behind us or seems to be very much behind us now and uh, things have revved up again quite dramatically in the last year. So from on the, on the upside, we're seeing that some of the ore exports that are going out of the bay are a little bit up, particularly zinc, but also a little bit copper. Ballast water discharges are starting to go up again. Lots of new projects coming on board here in Soldana Bay. Uh, not least of which power ships, uh, floating storage regasification units, RO plants, a lot of focus on uh, liquid petroleum gas and liquid natural gas, ship repair, um, mariculture production is up again. On the downside, unfortunately, we've seen quite a significant reduction in visitor numbers in the bay, in the lagoon, and I'll show you some data on that just now. A little bit down on shipping traffic, uh, ore exports, some of the ore exports, iron ore, manganese, lead, a little bit down. Effluent from the wastewater treatment works is a little bit down, which is encouraging. 
And uh, on the mariculture side, finfish production took a bit of a dive. Um, but on the whole, I think for the most part, when I'm seeing in terms of activities and discharges, definitely things slightly better for the bay, less human pressure on the bay during those COVID years. But as I say, that's turning around very fast and we're going back to a high pressure environment. Um, just a little bit on the um, uh, visitor numbers, tourist numbers. I'm just going to try and see. Okay, there is a pointer here. Um, these are data on visitor numbers to the West Coast National Park. We use them as some a measure, indication of how numbers of visitors to the Soldana area and Langebaan area are changing over time. We've got data from around 2005, 2006 up to the present time. Those initial years, very strong increase in visitor numbers year on year up to around 2017, 2018. Global financial crisis, 2018 saw a bit of a drop, particularly the number of tourists coming to, to South Africa. COVID, massive drop off in the numbers. We peaked at about uh, 350,000 people visiting the park per year, um, down to around 200,000 in 2018. And unfortunately, that trend seems to be going, continuing on a downward trajectory. I'm not sure why. I would have thought by now we would see an improvement. But unfortunately, this economy thrives on tourism. And it's critically important that this, we protect the state. Of, that's why we're protecting the state of the bay. It, because it's, it provides a foundation for, for tourism and for, 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 for um, economies associated with the visitor industry. A um, little bit on uh, seasonality and visitor numbers. We've got a sort of bimodal uh, tourist peak in the flower season, August, September, and then December, January, slightly lower peak when people come to Soldana Bay and Langabon Lagoon. Um, shipping traffic and ballast water, we've got data from the mid 1990s, 94, 95. Uh, clear increase over the years from around 250 vessels visiting the port per year up to a peak of around 600 in 2020. COVID years, we saw a bit of a drop off in the number of uh, vessels coming here, slightly re slight reduction in the demand for iron ore and other commodities around the world, saw that reduction in uh, shipping traffic here. And we've got a corresponding sort of tail off in the amount of ballast water discharged to the bay. Um, we had a rather anomalous measurement of uh, ballast water discharge in 21, 2021 which dropped down by almost two thirds. Uh, I'm not sure I agree, I'm not sure. I think there might've been a problem with that data, but I think that trend there is quite solid that there has been a reduction in the amount of ballast water discharged to the bay, which is positive at least in one respect. Um, other bits about uh, ore exports from the bay, we've got some data on iron ore exports going up from the early 2000s to a peak in around 2014, 2015, and then is leveled off after that. Um, from the multi-purpose terminal, we've got zinc, copper, and lead going out there. Not much change in the lead or the copper, but a very dramatic increase in the last few years. Uh, zinc, I don't know if zinc is good for COVID, but uh, certainly there's a massive increase in the demand for zinc and export of zinc. I think that's associated with the opening of a new mine in the Northern Cape and that zinc ore coming out here at the port of Soldana, multi-purpose terminal. Um, down here, manganese exports started in around 2014 and increased quite dramatically up to around 2018, um, leveling off at about uh, 4 million tons in uh, around 2018 and pretty much constant since then. Historically, there was some uh, iron ore coming out of the multi-purpose terminal, but that is now um, lumped with the iron ore from the, from, the, from the main iron ore terminal, so we don't really see much change there. Um, wastewater effluent from the wastewater treatment works in Soldana um, from early 2000s, 2003, volumes of wastewater going up, leveling off around 2010, and carrying on through to, uh, towards the present day at more or less the... Uh, at this kind of level, around uh, 3,000 meters cubed per day coming out from the Soldana Wastewater Treatment Works. Effluent goes down the Bok River and out into Small Bay. Um, and some interesting trends there. This is 2018 when the, uh, all of the effluent from the Soldana Wastewater Treatment Works was diverted to Arslo Mittel. To me, that was the most fantastic thing ever. It basically diverted all of that wastewater out of the bay. It was being um, put through an RO plant and being reused by ArcelorMittal. Unfortunately, 
Arsenal Mittel closed down shortly after that, was on uh, on care and maintenance at the moment, and that wastewater is now going back out into the bay. And that obviously has an impact on the ecology of the bay, but also poses some risks to human health, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, no evidence of any changes in wastewater outflow during the COVID period there. And I think that is basically linked to the fact that uh, Soldana is primarily resident people who live in Soldana are resident there year round. Um, if we look at the Langeban data, um, some slightly more interesting trends there. Very strong seasonality in the Langeban, the discharges from the wa Langeban wastewater treatment works, peaking during winter and then dropping down during summer, which is interesting. That's exactly the opposite of the kind of visitor trends where visitors are mostly coming to Langeban in, win in summer. But I think that's to do with the demand for, water, for irrigation water. Most of the water from the Langeban wastewater treatment works goes to irrigate golf courses, school fields. And so the volume that's actually going out into Langeban goes down during the summer months. And then there's less demand in winter. But definitely a bit of a tail off during the COVID period. Many fewer visitors in Langeban. Many people weren't able to access their, their houses, their holiday homes in Langeban. And they stayed away. So we saw quite a significant drop off in the volumes of wastewater coming out into Langeban during the COVID period. Um, mariculture production. Um, I think there's a. Um, the ADZ has had a huge boost for mariculture production, the, 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 the development of the agriculture development zone, the ADZ here in Soldana, has had a huge boost for the uh, mariculture industry here. Um, Soldana Bay is by far and away the largest or the most important center for mariculture production in South Africa. Mariculture production or offshore mariculture production requires calm water and there's very few, very little, there's very little available calm water habitat in our marine environment off the South African coastline. So Soldana is one of those few uh, places where we do have large areas of calm water and it is a very important area for mariculture production. Um, from the stats that uh, Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment have provided us with, um, when the ADZ first started in 2020, there were 28 rights holders with 15 operation of them being actually operational in the bay. Um, that dropped slightly in 2021, 27 rights holders, but many more of those were actually operational up to 24. And now 2022, 30 rights holders with 25 operational. Um, most of those rights holders are focusing on mussels. You can look at mussel production here from around 2000 to towards 2012. Uh, fairly constant at around uh, 500,000 tons per, per 500 tons per annum and then started to increase quite rapidly from 2012 onwards and uh, right towards the present day. A little bit of a dip in the peak of the COVID 2020. Most of the operators weren't able to export their product during that time, and very few people were going out to eat uh, at restaurants at that time. So the mariculture operators here in Soldana really, really struggled during those COVID years. They weren't able to sell their product, but their management costs of maintaining their farms were still ongoing. They had to continue with that. Um, oyster production uh, over a similar time period, much lower production. You're talking 500 to 3,000 tons here whereas the oyster is much lower, around 150 to 250 tons per annum. And uh, sly, a very gradual increase over time, but clearly oysters not as popular as mussels in this area, but are gradually increasing. And I expect that will continue to increase uh, going forwards. Most of this increased production is coming out in Big Bay. Production or the, the available rights sp water space in Small Bay has pretty much been capped as it is at the moment. So most of that new production is happening out here in Big Bay and then in Outer Bay here and uh, in the Outer Bay in the pink area down there. Um, one of the uh, things that came out as, as a, as a from, the, from the research that being, has been done around the ADZ production area, Jacques mentioned earlier, is this reef area, this culcrete reef area in Big Bay. It was recognized when Burgot Fleming did his work when they did the design work for the uh, Port of Soldana back in the 1970s, and then seemed to be largely forgotten about. And uh, when the, uh, the environmental impact assessment was done for the, for the agriculture development zone, this was largely ignored. And, uh, but it's suddenly come back on the table here. 
is a bit of a concern because a quite a large proportion of this identified reef area falls within the ADZ area in Big Bay. Around 30% of that reef area falls in the ADZ. Um, there is a concern mostly because of the biodiversity associated with that rocky reef substratum, higher biodiversity than associated with the sandy substratum, and uh, obviously a higher conservation importance. And most importantly, the monitoring protocols used in the ADZ are not really appropriate for, which are focused on monitoring impacts on soft sediment, not really appropriate for, for what's being done on the, for, the, for the, these hard, se se hard substratum environments. And uh, so there's been a lot of work and effort to mo adapt those protocols so that we can get a handle on what are the potential impacts of the uh, mariculture production on these reef areas. Is it significant? Is it something we need to worry about? And uh, just to get a handle on it. One of the main concerns was that the fin fish production area was focused in the center of that reef area. And uh, right now, fin fish production went up to about 5,000 tons a few years ago but has since dropped off to basically zero now. I don't think there's any fin fish production in Soldana Bay at the moment, so possibly not a big concern now, but it's something that we do need to keep an eye on and keep a handle on. Um, groundwater. Um, groundwater is something that we brought on, on board as part of the uh, State of the Bay monitoring program a few years ago with our partners, GEOS. Um, we recognize groundwater is hugely important in this area. There's very little surface water. We've got very low levels of rainfall on the west coast here, so groundwater is very important, especially as emergency water supply during drought conditions. Um, and uh, quite a lot of work has been done on groundwater in the Soldana Bay area. There's, a, there's large aquifers inland of the bay, the, um, the Langebein Vech aquifer up here, and the Irlandsfontein aquifer down there. And what's important about groundwater from my perspective is that there's a significant amount of groundwater that flows out of those aquifers out particularly into Langebaan Lagoon and that helps to prevent the lagoon from becoming what we call hypersaline or too hypersaline. Um, the lagoon is very shallow, very warm, there's a lot of evaporative, um, a lot of evaporation of water from there and with the evaporation fresh water is leaving the lagoon and it tends to become more salty with time. And this tidal exchange does uh, try and address, address that to some extent, but that f f outflow of fresh water into the head of the lagoon there plays a very, very important role in preventing the lagoon from becoming too salty. Um, currently, if we look at uh, groundwater use in the Soldana Bay region, the main uses of groundwater are the agricultural sector. They're using around 1.5 million cubic meters of groundwater per annum to irrigate uh, various crops. Other uses in the other u other important uses in the Soldana region are the Soldana Bay municipality. They have two well fields. They've got the the Langebaan Road uh, aquifer well field that has the capacity to extract about five million cubic meters of water per annum from the the Langebaan Road aquifer. But they only exercise that right primarily during drought conditions when they aren't able to get enough water from the Berg River. Um, similarly, the Hope, field well, the Hope Field well field was put in place quite recently. It's got the capacity of extracting about 1.6 million cubic meters per annum. But again, that's primarily a drought, uh, a drought mechanism to provide water during periods of drought when there's not enough water in the Berg River. The other important um, uh, groundwater use in this area is the, the Elansfontein phosphate mine. And, uh, but they aren't using, well, they are abstracting groundwater primarily to dewater their pit so that they can do their mining. But that water is reinjected further downstream. So, in effect, there's a net zero use of water there. But nonetheless, we are concerned. Um, Geos assures me, Julian Conrad assures me that uh, use of groundwater in this region is completely sustainable. They estimate that uh, usable groundwater is in the region of 15.2 million cubic meters per annum. So if you add all of those up numbers up, we're still well below that 15 million cubic meter per annum sustainable limit. And uh, so he assures me we are, we're okay there. The lagoon is at no risk at the moment. Um, but he does say comprehensive monitoring is essential. And certainly the data that they have been collecting, they, there's now regular monitoring over a suite of some 25 boreholes in and around the inland of Soldana Bay and Langebaan Lagoon. 
And most of those data show a pattern something like this, where this is data on water level of groundwater in those various bowls, and there's very little change over time. So there's no, if this line was going down over time, I'd start being concerned, because that means if that water table starts going down, it means that outflow to Langabon Lagoon is going to go down, and then we're at risk of the lagoon becoming a giant salt pan. So right now, we're okay, but it's very important that we keep an eye on groundwater levels and groundwater use, and that, we, that groundwater is primarily reserved for use during periods of drought, and that during in the intervening periods where we've got good rainfall, that we recharge those groundwater reserves. So possibly there's a lot of talk of using treated um, wastewater to recharge the groundwater. I think that's very, very important, and I think we really got to look at that very seriously. Because sooner or later, we're going to go into the next drought. And when it happens, we're going to want to use that groundwater. And if you carry on using the groundwater sooner or later, you're not going to have that option anymore. So very important to keep up with that. Um, moving on to into the bay now, looking at uh, water quality in the bay. We've been doing a lot of work on monitoring uh, temperature over time, water temperature in the bay. We've got a particular mooring point here in Small Bay at a place called North Boy. We've got a, 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 a mooring system which has little thermistors at different depths in the water column from the surface all the way down to the bottom. And we track changes in water temperature at those different depths over time. There's some very, very important and interesting patterns there, which I, I have spoken about in the past. I don't really have time to talk too much about that now. But suffice it to say, we've got very, very high variability in water temperature during the summer. When we get upwelling, temperature goes down. Then we get that relaxation of the upwelling. Temperature goes up. And we get very strong diurnal fluctuations, much lower levels of variability during winter because we don't have the southeasterly winds driving the upwelling. And uh, we saw some very interesting patterns or changes in the in water temperature in the bay during the drought with the weather patterns associated with the drought causing some interesting changes in the temperature again i'm not going to go in that to that too much now because i have spoken about that before um well, it's just moving on then to uh oxygen levels of dissolved oxygen in the water column are very very important all living organisms or almost all living organisms require access to to oxygen and very important for driving ecosystem functioning and eco ecosystem production. Um, we're very fortunate, part of the, uh, the Aquaculture Development Zone monitoring program, we've got access now to some really good data on oxygen levels in the bottom waters in Small Bay and Big Bay. Uh, Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries is doing, sorry, Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment have got four monitoring stations in the bay now that they've been monitoring since the beginning of 2000. Uh, two stations in Small Bay, one a control station which is away from where the, the mussel, mussel rafts and oyster ropes are moored, and the other right in amongst the oyster rafts, oyster ropes, uh, which we call the, the, the aquaculture station. And likewise in Big Bay we've got a control station which is quite some distance away from where the ADZ is, and, a, and an impact station which is close to that. Um, on the left here are the two data from the two big bay stations. On the right, data from the two small bay stations. And uh, what you can see here, if you look at the variation over time, it tends to ma ma mirror what's happening with the water temperature. Oxygen levels in winter are, tend to be, the bay tends to be very well oxygenated in winter. The blue shading there is what we call oxic conditions, when the oxygen concentrations are above 4 milliliters per liter, means there's plenty of oxygen available for marine life, everyone's happy, lots of oxygen. Um, when we drop down to a little bit lower, we call this hypoxic conditions, when the oxygen levels are between 2 and 4 milligrams per liter. It's a little bit stressful for the marine organisms. It's not quite as much oxygen as they'd like, but they can still thrive there. And then when it drops below 2 milligrams per liter, we call that anoxic. There is not really enough oxygen available for most living organisms. If we look at the control station, this is away from the mariculture farms, you can see that periodically, especially during the summer months, uh, the, ox the conditions in, small, in Big Bay and in sorry, Big Bay, both Big Bay and Small Bay, conditions become quite anoxic during the summer months, and that is linked to upwelling, where you, where, where with the southeasterly winds drive the surface waters offshore out of the bay, and it draws in deep 
ocean water, water from the deep ocean. It's mostly anoxic water comes into the bay during the summer months. And we see that the bottom waters in the bay become very, very poorly oxygenated at that time. It is, a, it is a natural phenomenon. It's always been like that, but it's probably been slightly exacerbated, certainly in Small Bay, by the construction of the ore terminal and the causeway linking Marcus Island to the mainland because the water circulation there is much reduced because of that obstruction. But what is important if we look at, compare what's happening at those control stations on the top to the impact stations on the bottom there, Big Bay, very little difference between the control and the impact stations, which says in Big Bay is not the, the aquaculture operations, the ADZ is having very little impact on oxygen levels in Big Bay. But moving on to Small Bay, if you look at the amount of time that scratchy blue line spends in the red zone down here, it's quite a lot higher in Small Bay than it at the impact station in amongst the oyster rafts as it is at the control station. So that says that uh, mariculture activities, farming, is having an impact on oxygen levels in Small Bay. And that, I think, was the primary reason why the decision was made to cap mariculture production in Small Bay, because of the concern that this, if any further expansion is going to have an impact on oxygen levels in the bay. Those oxygen levels in the bay, in the small bay, are affected by organic waste discharge from the wastewater treatment works, from the fish factories. Um, that has gone down a lot over the years, but we still see that oxygen levels are potentially problematic in small bay, and I think it's very valid and a very good decision that the department made not to seek to expand mariculture operations in small bay anymore, because they're really under some stress. Um, and there's my smiley face. No impact of COVID here. Um, COVID didn't really affect the wind or weather patterns around uh, or oceanographic patterns around the bay. A um, little bit more on uh, water quality. This is, uh, I mentioned earlier, we are doing some monitoring or Elans, the Elansfontein phosphate mine specifically is funding some monitoring work on temperature and salinity at the head of the lagoon. We were very concerned about what would happen to freshwater outflow from the aquifers into the lagoon as a result of their dewatering their mining pit, re-injecting it. Was it really going to uh, not affect the lagoon in any way, that the outflow of uh, uh, freshwater from the aquifer in the lagoon? And uh, we've been monitoring since uh, 2021 or in 2020 at the head of the lagoon at Gielbeck there. And we're picking up some very, very interesting patterns, particularly in salinity at the head of the lagoon. Um, what is important here is the salinity profile is the one in blue there. I want you to focus on that. And you need to understand that normal seawater has roughly 35 grams of salt per liter of water. So we call that a salinity of 35 parts per thousand. So if you imagine a line going roughly across the middle of that picture, that would be normal seawater. And if we measure salt concentration in seawater somewhere in the middle of Saldana Bay, it would hover around very much solidly on that 35 parts per thousand mark and wouldn't vary much at all. But at the head of the lagoon, salinity is quite variable because of the variations in the freshwater input. So during winter, uh, when there's quite strong outflow, from the aquifer into the lagoon, maybe even a little bit of rainfall running out into the lagoon, salinity drops down to about 30 or 32 parts per thousand. So it's uh, from 35 drops down about 10% down to about 32, slightly less saline than seawater. But what's very important during summer, from November onwards, you see the salinity climbing up there quite strongly, up to around 42 parts per thousand. And that's at about the limit of what most marine organisms can tolerate. So if it is critically important, we, this, this understanding, this is what we would consider the natural dynamics. We don't think there's any, Elan's Fontaine has yet had any impact, or if it's going to have an impact, we're only going to feel that a long time in the future. So right now we're understanding, previously we didn't realize how salty conditions became at the top of the lagoon. We now understand it does rise up to over 42, almost 44 parts per thousand which is very much at the limit of what most marine organisms can tolerate. So we're in a very fine balance there. If we start to use too much groundwater from the aquifers around the lagoon and that groundwater flow into the lagoon is reduced even by a small amount, we're going to see some catastrophic impacts on biodiversity in the lagoon. And that's critically important. It's the West Coast National Park. 
It's a marine protected area. It's a biosphere reserve. It's a critically important biodiversity area. So to me, the focus on groundwater is critically important that we keep an eye on that and make sure that we don't use too much. So what I'm saying when we say, yes, it's fine to use that groundwater during periods of drought, but we are beholden to re-inject that groundwater outside. When we've got plenty of water available, we need to focus on keep topping up that groundwater reservoir. Otherwise, we're going to have a catastrophic situation developing here at the top of the lagoon. So, so far, happy picture. Um, okay, moving on to some more water quality stuff. This is uh, fecal coliforms. Um, the Soldano Water Quality Trust, since uh, early 1990, well, sorry, the late 1990s, around 99, they started monitoring fecal coliform levels at various sites around the perimeter of the bay. This is critically important because fecal coliforms give us an indication of the risk to human health of other pathogenic bacteria or viruses being present in the water. And so these little stations, there's a whole group of stations here in Small Bay. The first 11 stations are in Small Bay. There's a suite of stations here in Big Bay in yellow and a suite of stations here in Langaban Lagoon in blue. I'm going to take that thing out of the way. This is the data series since 1999 towards the present day. You can see when the trust first started monitoring levels of fecal coliforms in the bay, things were pretty dire. Um, just for your information, sorry, there's a color coding here. The blue EX means excellent water quality, 100% safe for recreational contact recreation. You can swim there and you've got no, your risks of contracting some nasty disease are probably quite low. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and then the green is good. Risks are probably very low, still fairly very safe to swim. Fair becomes a bit marginal. Not sure you want to swim there. And red, you definitely don't want to swim there. The risks of you contracting some nasty disease are quite high. Um, so if you look at that picture in the early part of the record, 2000 to 2005, conditions in Small Bay were pretty bad. Lo huge volumes of uh, treated effluent from the Soldana wastewater treatment were going into, sm into Small Bay and the beaches around Small Bay were mostly in fairly poor condition and not, not great for recreational activity. Huge improvement around 2006. You can see there the amount of blue has gone up dramatically and now winding forward to the present day, 2002, almost all of the sites around the bay and the lagoon are in excellent health, which is fantastic. It means it's safe for tourists, it's safe for local people to swim here. There are still two sites that are, are, are problematic. The one is at Hoochies Bay, um, still in poor condition and has remained so for much of the last few years. And then also at the mouth of the Bok River, where the effluent from the Soldana Wastewater Treatment Works comes out, remain in poor condition. So there's still some work to be done, but wow, what an improvement from what it was like back in the day. <laughs> so there's your unhappy face in that little area there, but otherwise, nice, nice result. Um, as far as COVID is concerned, we did see a slight improvement. I think, I don't know how much of that improvement. I hope it's not only due to COVID, but uh, as I said, I don't think numbers of people in Soldana changed much during co the COVID period. People just stayed in their houses. They carried on flushing their toilets. So not much change there, but but overall, if you look at the long term, what a great improvement and uh, fa fantastic outcome. I myself would uh, relish the day when Arsenal Mittal starts up again, and especially if they're going to take on and start taking up all of that wastewater from the Soldana Wastewater Treatment Works again, because I think that would have a dramatic positive impact on the health of the bay. Um, Okay, moving on then to trace metals. Um, trace metals find their way into the bay from a whole lot of different sources, industrial waste, run, runoff from the roads, um, all over the place, and they find their way into the bay. Very difficult to measure trace metals in seawater because they come out in very low concentrations, but it's much easier. Mar living, certain marine organisms tend to pick up those trace metals from the water, particularly bivalves, mussels, and oysters, and they concentrate them in their flesh. And if we measure concentrations in their flesh, it gives us a good idea of what's going on in the environment. So that's exactly what we... Oh, sorry, I keep pushing the wrong button here. 
Um, that's what, exactly what we do here. We've got data from on. I've got data on two trace metals that are important here in the bay. The first is lead, and the second is cadmium. And uh, on the left-hand side here are levels of lead in mussels, and uh, here are levels of cadmium. Sorry, le lead on the, across the top here in mussels on the left, and oysters on the right. The open circles, those open symbols are mussels that have been we've harvested from the shoreline. So those are mussels collected from the shoreline around the perimeter of the bay. The solid symbols, these little triangles and the other ones a bit lower down, are from the mariculture operators further offshore. So they're on the rafts and on the long lines. And what you should be able to see very clearly and very quickly with the lead levels is that the lead levels on mussels on the shoreline tend to be much, much higher than those on the rafts offshore. So that tells me immediately that levels of lead in the close nearshore environment are much higher than those offshore. And uh, that if you look at the, the sort of foodstuff recommended um, levels for lead in foodstuffs is on the red line there. They say you shouldn't really eat seafood when the lead levels are above uh, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. So that says to me a lot of the time that mussels along the shoreline are probably unsafe in terms of for, hum for, for human consumption, that you're going to risk lead poisoning if you eat them, whereas those from the mariculture farms offshore are perfectly safe. And that's because those mussels are feeding on newly upwatered world water, water brought into the bay, um, whereas the ones on the shoreline are getting, uh, picking up lead from, the, from contaminants in the shoreline, from contaminants that are suspended up from the sediments. Um, similar picture with cadmium. Again, cadmium levels tend to be much higher on the shoreline than they do offshore. But um, some of the, uh, particularly here in the outer bay, levels of cadmium are quite high. We know cadmium is naturally high in the Benguela region. Uh, for some reason, we've got naturally high levels of cadmium on our west coast. And uh, that, the reason that basically says that levels of cadmium in seafood are much higher than international standards suggest they would be, but they seem to be okay nonetheless. Um, this is talking about, th these data are on sediment quality in the bay and specifically focusing on changes in particle size over time. So when we look at sediment, we can break it down into different size particles. The very core stuff, the sort of two, three millimeter size and above is what we call gravel, sand, is the fine stuff we typically find on the beaches, and mud is the very, very fine particle material that we tend to find in estuaries and lagoons. And I've got data from a number of stations in Small Bay, which we've been monitoring quite intensively since 1974. So that was prior to the date when the port development took place, prior to the construction of the Marcus Island Causeway and the construction of the iron ore terminal. And this ties in very, very nicely with some of the, the work that Jacques was talking about just now. Back in 1970s, the sediments in the bay were almost comprised almost 100% of sand. Practically no mud and no gravel in that area. But if you wind forward to the, around the 1990s, unfortunately our data is very, very patchy between 1974 and uh, the 1990s. But when we wind forward to around 1999, we suddenly found there was a very, very dramatic change in the composition of the sediments pretty much throughout the bay with a massive increase in the amount of mud in the sediments. Mud now going up to almost 90, in some cases 100% of the material comprising the sediments in the bay and the superficial layers of the bay were comprised of mud at that time. And uh, in, at most stations we've seen a decline in that amount of mud in the sediment going down quite dramatically over the years, taking almost 10, almost 20 years to get back to levels that were reminiscent of prior to the construction of the ore terminal. And to me that ties in quite nicely what Jacques is saying about the erosion of sediment from the bay. Basically what's been happening over those 20 years is we had a lot of dredging and a lot of activity in the bay in the 1990s. Uh, port construction, a lot of dredging, mobilizing fine sediment up into the water column and then settled down on the surface on the bottom of the bay, and uh, then levels have since declined quite gradually over the years. And for me, that's a really, really positive sign 
uh, a positive development in this area. Um, fine sediment tends to attract trace metals and pollutants and contaminants. It's got a lot of high surface area to volume ratio, so we tend to find trace nasty contaminants tend to be strongly associated with that fine material, the muddy material, much less so with the sandy or the gravel. And also, water penetration through fine mud is much, much less than it is through sand or gravel. So the sediments become very anoxic and, uh, and uh, not suitable for, for marine organisms to burrow into to live on. So for me, this is a very, very strong positive development. And uh, I think, as Jacques mentioned now, is associated with the removal of that. That, that fine material has been largely flushed out of the bay, mostly leaving coarse material. But for me, what's important is that coarse material is now, the material in the bay now is much more reminiscent of what it was like prior to the massive construction activities in the bay. So that's a strongly positive development, and I give it a very big smiley face. And it's very important, we'll see now when I show you the results of the biota monitoring we've been doing in the bay, that the biota have responded very positively to this change in the sediment dynamics in the bay. Um, organic carbon and organic nitrogen. This is organic material in the sediment, and the changes over time very, very strongly mirror those with the sediment. So back in the 1970s, you can't even see any organic carbon or nitrogen, or barely can you see it. Levels of organic carbon and nitrogen in the sediment were very, very low back in those days. Went up to very, very high levels, 2% there, 10%, 12% around here. And, uh, but subsequently, along with the flushing out of the fine sediment, we've seen much of that organic carbon, organic material being flushed out of, this, out of the bay. And with that, likely improvement in levels of dissolved oxygen in the bay. Because that decomposition of the organic material tends to uh, reduce oxygen levels in the bay. So again, a very strong positive development here. And I think I added a big smiley face there. Um, trace metals in the sediment. Um, I'm just looking at four trace metals here, cadmium, copper, lead, and manganese. Cadmium, source of cadmium we think is largely natural on the west coast here, naturally high levels. Um, the red line indicates, the dotted red line in each case indicates levels where, at, that's the level, if, it, if levels exceed that, we expect to start seeing toxicity to marine organisms. So cadmium is quite high in the bay, it's naturally high. And there's not a lot we can do about it, but it hasn't really changed much over the years. I also, I looked at the other trace metals in the bay in relation to ore exports, because there's obviously a risk by exporting ore from the bay. We're likely to see some of that contamination going into the sediments. If we look at copper, the highest levels of copper are here in the, in the small craft harbor area there. Multi-purpose terminal where copper is exported are slightly higher but the other sites, not much uh, copper there. And if you look at copper exports over time, from 2011, um, we see not much change. I think these data start from around 1999. So there doesn't seem to have much change. I don't think there's much of a link between copper export and copper levels in the sediment. Um, what I think the copper, a lot of the copper in the bay is coming from is cleaning, uh, ship repair activities. Copper is toxic to marine organisms, and we use it for and use it in anti-fouling coatings. So the ship repair activities on the small craft harbour here are accountable for probably a lot of the copper coming out there, and maybe some of the copper there coming from the copper exports. Uh, manganese, I showed you earlier, went up dramatically after 2013, 2014, but if we look at manganese levels in the bay, haven't really changed much. So it doesn't seem like much of the manganese from the exports is are finding their way into the bay. Not really much change there. Um, lead, here, if you look at where the lead is a problem, lead is mostly a problem here next to the multi-purpose terminal where the lead is exported. So it's not surprising there's clearly some link between lead export and lead levels in the bay. Uh, lead export going down slightly, and I could imagine some sort of downward trend there. So there seems to be quite a clear link there, and that's something we need to watch out for. Finally, uh, zinc, I mentioned earlier, zinc exports are going up quite dramatically in the last few years. We don't currently monitor zinc levels in the sediment in the bay, but maybe we should be because we might be seeing some kind of link there. Um, 
soft bottom benthic macrofauna. These are the bugs that live in the sediment, burrow into the sediment. They're small, mostly sort of one millimeter, a couple of millimeters in size. And some very interesting trends here over time. We've been monitoring these uh, benthic, what we call benthic macrofauna since around 99 towards the present day. And right across Small Bay, Big Bay, and Langabine Lagoon, we see the same trend of increasing abundance over time. This is actually biomass. This is the total mass of living organisms that live in the sediment. And they've shown quite a nice increase. Small Bay, quite variable, but very clear increase over time. Same with Big Bay, same with Langabine Lagoon. And I think that is strongly related to that reduction in fine mud in the sediment. This, this time series starts around 1999 where, the pe where mud levels peaked over here and those reduction in mud levels seem to be accompanied by a very clear increase in the biomass of living organisms and sediments. Makes complete sense to me. Reduction in organic material in the sediments, increase in oxygenation has allowed those communities to recover. These bugs, they may be very small and insignificant, but they are the food for the fish, for the birds. So it's very, very important. These things are the foundation of the ecosystem. And with this, we haven't seen much dredging uh, port development activities in the, the last 20 years in the Bay, or if there have been a very relatively small scale events. And that has allowed those levels of fine sediment, fine material in the sediments to decline. And the result has been a very beautiful increase in uh, levels of macrofauna in the sediment. Really, really nice outcome. Um, rocky intertidal communities, these are the, the bugs that live on the, the rocky shores around the bay. They live in between the high water mark and the low water mark. So at high tide, they're completely covered by the sea. At low tide, they're completely exposed. We've been monitoring these rocky intertidal communities since 2005. I don't have a lot to say about these numbers of species. We've picked up a slight gradual increase over time from 2005 up to 2022 when we did our most recent surveys. Two reasons for that. I think one is we've picked up a few new alien species over the years. Alien species are a big problem here. I'll talk a bit about more about them later. Um, and we've, we, they're gradually increasing the number of alien species that are arriving in the bay on our shores in South Africa mostly associated with ballast water discharge. Ships pick up ballast water in foreign ports around the world. It might be in Europe or the Far East. They come here, discharge their ballast water and take on cargo, iron ore or whatever. And in that ballast water are eggs, larvae and juveniles or marine organisms that take hold in the bay. So we're seeing a slight increase in the numbers of those alien organisms. And also I think we're getting a little bit better at what we do. So we keep picking up new species each time. So it's not only aliens, but there is a slight increase. We've got up from an average of around 20 species up to around 25 species. And that closely ties in with the sort of five or so new alien species we pick up in the bay. Right now, if you look at the rocky shores in the bay, they're almost completely dominated by two alien species. One is the Mediterranean mussel, these black things over here, and the other is something known as the acorn barnacle, which is this white stuff here. And those that comes from North America, and our shores almost completely dominated by these two alien species, which is a little bit sad because those alien species have displaced what was otherwise natural indigenous species that used to occur here. Um, We've been tracking quite carefully these two alien species, the acorn barnacle and the European mussel over there. Um, when we first started monitoring, sorry, it's not very clear here, at about 2003 or 2005 when we first started monitoring, we can see a very clear decrease in the number of these uh, alien barnacles and a very similar pattern with the Mediterranean mussels. Numbers have decreased quite dramatically over time. And I think that's a very interesting biological phenomenon is that these things, Fish, birds tend to prey on these organisms, but when an alien species arrives new in the bay, the predators don't necessarily recognize it as food. It's a slightly different to the native mussel that they used to, and they look at this and they're not sure about that, I'll just leave it alone, I'll carry on eating the native mussels, and likewise with the barnacles. But over time, they peck it and say, actually it doesn't taste too bad, it tastes all right, I'll give it a try. And then they suddenly realize, oh, actually these things are good to eat, and they start to focus on them. 
So in the initial period during an invasion, you get an explosion in the population because the predators are simply ignoring them. And then the predators suddenly recognize, actually, these are good to eat. And actually, they are very yummy, and there are lots of them, so we'll focus on them. And it, they tend to depress their populations. So it's a very interesting kind of cycle we've seen over the 10, 20 years that we've been monitoring this. But it's primarily of academic interest rather than any other interest. These organisms are still completely dominating our shores here, which is unfortunate. But uh, certainly things have improved a little bit over time. This is another uh, marine alien that we've been keeping a close eye on. First arrived in the bay in about 2003. It's called a pea crab. It lives in the burrows of the sand prawns, the, the pink prawns you use for catching fish. These guys invade those burrows and they live in there. Um, initially, we saw the numbers going up very, very quickly over the first couple of years, and then they seem to have stabilized and they're relatively constant now. Doesn't seem like anything's eating them. Their populations haven't started to go down yet. Um, we, we're very concerned about alien species in, in Saldana Bay, particularly on the west coast, because numbers of alien species in this area are amongst the highest in the country. And uh, so with the, with the help of Anglo-American, we've started uh, a new program here in the state of in, in Saldana Bay using environmental DNA to try and monitor numbers of aliens or to pick up and identify alien species in the bay. Um, Aliens are very difficult to detect. When they first arrive, there's maybe one or two of them, and uh, it takes them a long time before the population spreads. But when these numbers are low, that's exactly the time we need to try and get rid of them before they become so widespread that they're almost impossible to remove. So we always say early detection with aliens is, is critically important, and uh, so this is why we're working with Anglo-American now with this eDNA technology to help us to try and track the arrival of alien species and the expansion of alien species in Saldana Bay. eDNA or environmental DNA is DNA that we can find in the environment, so it's in, in the water, in the sediment, in the environment, and it's, it's DNA that's shed by the organisms in their skin, scales, feces, mucus, whatever, goes into the environment, becomes diluted in the environment. We come along, we take a sample of water, and we do test that using these uh, very expensive and very... Uh, fancy molecular techniques, and it'll tell us what species are present in that broader water body. So it just makes it easy. We don't have to sample everywhere. We can simply go and collect a few water samples out of the bay, test that using these molecular techniques, and it tells us, ah, oh, yes, you do have that species, or yes, that species, suddenly you start to pick up new species based on this environmental DNA technology. So we haven't got any results yet. We only just collected the samples a few months ago. They're being analyzed and hopefully we'll be able to use this as an important technique going forward to, to follow, track the expansion and the arrival of alien species in the bay and help us to understand where these aliens are coming from, what, what is causing it, how do we, and maybe we can even look at controlling aliens in the future. Um, moving on, moving up the food chain to fish. Um, we've been monitoring fish populations in the bay for a very long time. These are numbers of species that we've picked up every year since 1986 through to the present day. Sampling was a bit patchy in the beginning, but it's become more, um, more regular in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Small Bay, Big Bay, and Langebein Lagoon. If you cast your eye over those pictures, in most instances you can get an idea that there's a slight downward trajectory in all those pictures says to me that the number of fish species in the bay is going down with time. In small bay particularly, less so in big bay and possibly less so in Langevin Lagoon. But our impacts on the environment are impacting on fish populations here. Particularly in small bay, this is a little bit obscured, but these are numbers of uh, different species, hodders, uh, silver sides, white stump nose, gobies, blacktails in small bay. And when we started our monitoring, White stump nose, for example, we were getting roughly one fish per meter squared in the bay, and now we're getting, we're lucky if we get one per hundred or thousand meters squared. So we're having an impact on fish in the bay, particularly in small bay, but particularly the popular angling species and commercially important species that are caught by the line fishery. Um, interesting uh, thing about COVID 
is, as Alison, or sorry, Sasanda mentioned earlier, you picked up an increase in white stump nose. We picked up quite a dramatic increase in the number of white stump nose recruits. Small fish, most of what we're looking at here are the small little recruits, new recruits, a couple of months old, and there was quite a massive increase of those during 2020. Unfortunately, during 2020, sorry, 2021, we've got quite a massive increase. So we've been collecting out of our, we're sampling six sites in the bay, 16 sites in the bay, and back in the 1990s, we would catch maybe 500, 1,000, 2,000 white stump nose every year. That dropped down to maybe less than 10 every year. And during 2021, we saw that bounce up to several hundred again, and we were so encouraged. And it told me that simply reducing fishing pressure, people were confined to their homes. They weren't catching white stump nose in the lagoon anymore. So that meant just enough white stump nose were able to reach the size at maturity, to breed, to spawn, and those juveniles came through during 2021. And unfortunately, numbers have dropped down again during 2022. Now, but it, it speaks volumes. We've been asking for years to that, that uh, bag limit, size limits in the lagoon are, or bag limits specifically, reduce fishing pressure. We need to reduce fishing pressure. Langaban is a massively popular fishing spot. Many people come here from all over the country to fish here. And if they, go, if they come here for one reason, to catch fish, and they bring their families, they bring their friends. And if in time, the numbers of white stump nose continue to decline. People are going to say, well, I'm not coming here anymore. I can catch better fish in KZN, or I can catch better fish in Eastern Cape. They won't come here anymore. So we've been calling for years to try and put a, increase the, reduce the bag limit. Currently, people are allowed to catch wh five white stump nose per day. That's way more than anyone can eat in a day, even, even if you feed your whole family. We've been suggesting, let's decrease that size. Decrease that bag limit and, and conversely to increase the minimum size limit because these fish currently the minimum size limit is set just at the size when a fraction of the population will be mature enough to spawn. We want to see that in size limit increased so that people are forced to return those fish to the water so at least they can spawn for one or two years before they're caught and that simply sustains the population going forward. Um, I'm going to move on quickly. Sorry, I'm probably running out of time. You're all getting bored with me. Um, bird populations in Soldana and Langebaan, two important populations, the seabirds breeding on the islands and the waders, water birds in the lagoon. Firstly, seabirds breeding on the islands, I've told you for many years, we've got a huge problem here. Numbers back in the, back in the day in the 1990s, 1980s, numbers of seabirds were topping 20,000, 30,000 birds in the bay here. And you can see from most of these graphs, penguins, uh, cormorants, another cormorant, the gannets, numbers have dropped off dramatically. These populations are less than 10%, maybe 5%, maybe 1% of what they used to be. And we know that that's largely because of their food. This, the graphs on the right-hand side here are sardine from 1990 up to the present day. And massive fishing pressure on sardines in the 1960s and 1970s those pelagic fish populations basically collapsed, and with it, the bird populations collapsed, because that's their main food source. Numbers of sardines recovered quite dramatically around the early 2000s, and you saw numbers of bird numbers correspondingly going up there. But since then, populations of sardines and also anchovy have gone down so dramatically, these birds are just don't have enough food. And it's a very tragic situation. It's not it's not a lot we can do in terms of the health of the bay. It's just an unfortunate thing that their populations are dependent on their foodstuffs. The other important thing that happened with birds in, on the islands in Soldana Bay, we had those islands being invaded by pelicans, and the pelicans started preying on the chicks of these birds. And also seals started to prey on some of these seabirds while they were vulnerable on the islands when the chicks were young. Huge effort from Sand Parks and Volunteer Program, the Penguin Watch Program has largely sorted that problem out. We've got now volunteers stationed on the islands during the breeding season every year. They drive away the problem seals, they chase away the pelicans because that helps reduce pressure on these seabirds. And that's a very important program and should strongly be encouraged. Uh, birds in Langaban Lagoon, similar story. Numbers have gone down from around 50,000 birds back in the 1970s down to about 5,000 birds now. And, but very interestingly, there's COVID. 
because the birds recovered in 2020 and also not so much but almost as much in 2022. Um, very, very interesting we had that pattern and what we think is that by confining people to their homes just for that brief period these birds were able to recover. These birds are mostly migratory birds that breed up in the Arctic tundra. They fly up there 10,000 miles to breed, lay their eggs, bring up their chicks in the tundra and they come back down here, yeah, down south and they feed during our summer months in Langaban Lagoon and they go back north again. But the big problem is as they fly over southern Europe, someone pulls out a shotgun and shoots them. And by, during COVID, people were locked up in their homes and they couldn't shoot those birds. And it had a very dramatic impact on, particularly in the migratory waders here in Langebaan. Um, the, the, the resident waders, this is the ones on the bottom here, have also been going down over time. Unfortunately, the people that do those bird counts weren't able to get out during the peak of COVID, during the winter, but they did get out in 2021. And we see that the resident waders also responded. So that says to me, it's not just, we can't just blame people shooting these birds up in Europe. It's us too. Our human presence in and around Soldana Bay, in the lagoon, does affect these birds and they are sensitive to our disturbance. And they are at least, we are at least partially accountable for the reduction in the numbers of these birds. Here are some of the individual species, turnstones, plovers, curly sandpiper, knots. Most of them you can see that very nice uptick during COVID. So those birds responded in a massively positive way to COVID. They absolutely love COVID. They can't wait for it to come back. <laughs> um, seals. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Seals, Cape fur seal. It's indigenous, uh, endemic to southern Africa. You get it from Ango it goes from Angola around to the eastern Cape there. The little dots are the seal breeding colonies uh, around our coastline. Um, Recently, seals started to breed on Fondling Island in, uh, in Soldana Bay. And uh, around about 2006, we started seeing the first seals breeding, first pups produced on Fondling Island. And we saw quite a rapid increase over the sort of 10, 15 years after that, up to around 20,000 pups per year produced on Fondling Island. We seem to have reached some sort of carrying capacity level. The populations have pretty much stabilized that since from that point. I think it's basically, that's the amount of food that can the, it is, the, those ones have enough food, just, just enough food to support about 20,000 pups per year. Um, the picture at the top there just shows um, uh, seal populations over, over the last century. Back in the pre the 1900s, we absolutely decimated the seals. We clubbed every single one we could. And uh, populations around the whole country were reduced to about 10,000 seals, pups produced per year. And when seal pupping, when, when clubbing seals was banned back in the um, 1930s, 1940s, we saw a dramatic increase in the population. So the population recovered back towards what it was like historically, around 300,000 pups produced per year, and kind of leveled off there. So many people see seals as a huge problem. I'm not a fan of seals myself. They eat my fish. But um, here in Soldana, the, for me, the main problem with seals is they've been predating on seabirds on the islands there, the juvenile seabirds. And uh, so thanks to that volunteer program run by Sand Parks, that is largely sorted now. There are very few seals that actually breed in Soldana Bay. Most of the seals you see in the Soldana Bay are young seals. The adult females, the adult males are mostly feeding offshore. I don't think there's enough food for them in Soldana Bay. The mariculture facilities do tend to attract the seals. They use them for, for uh, pulling out of the water and uh, they're probably obviously attracted to the fin fish in the cages. But um, people, a lot of, I've always, I always get questions about seals at these presentations. And what I can tell you is that Yes, seal numbers have increased dramatically over the last 15 years, but populations have been largely stable for the last five years at least. Um, so, just to summarize on some of the key findings from, from the, the last year or the last several years, um, the COVID-19 pandemic certainly had quite a significant impact on conditions in Soldana Bay. Uh, we saw some slowdown in development, 
a little bit of a reduction in shipping traffic. Some exports were down. Mariculture production was down. Visitor numbers have been down quite dramatically, which is a bit concerning. Wastewater discharge went down, certainly in Langebaan. Um, but other, other, other aspects were not affected. Some of the ore, metal ore exports just seemed to carry on irrespective. There were some interesting and, and, and very much encouraging, I would say, responses in the biota, particularly the waders in Langebaan Lagoon. That recovery there says we, it is in our power to do something about this. We can't just say, oh, well, it's happening somewhere else. It's got nothing to do with us. Actually, yes, we can do something about it. And specifically, white stump nose recruitment. We are impacting heavily on the stocks of those fish, and those, those fish are very important for driving tourism patterns here. Um, in the longer term, overall picture, water and sediment quality in the bay seem to be improving. Oxygen levels in small bay are a little bit concerning, but um, certainly one of the most encouraging trends I see here is the benthic macrofauna, how strongly and positively that has been responded to the changes in sediment structure in the bay. And uh, for me, that's a hugely positive outcome. And uh, very interesting to tie that to what Jacques is talking about with the erosion and the removal of sediments from the bay. Um, fish populations in the bay are very variable, but definitely seem to be declining over time, which is a concern. Birds breeding on the islands also still in decline. It's mostly due to their food supply. Not a lot we can do about that, unfortunately. And marine aliens are definitely increasing here, and that's something that we can do something about, and we do have to. Um, in, yeah, so in terms of the overall impression, I think we're doing well here, but don't take your eyes off the road. I think we are doing a lot of work to protect the health of the bay, and it is paying, paying dividends, but we need to keep up the hard work. There is immense threats on the horizon. There's massive pressure coming to this. Development pressure is, is unrelenting, and it's, it's always going to be there. And we need to find that balance as Andre was talking about, the balance between environment and development. And you kill the, gold, the goose that lays the golden eggs, that healthy environment is the golden goose. You need to look after that, otherwise you're not going to get the eggs. Um, recommendations going forwards, wastewater treatment, wastewater discharges must be properly licensed and monitored going forward. It's very important. Reclamation of wastewater must be prioritized, and we need to look at re-injecting groundwater into the aquifers when we get the chance. Coastal management setback lines must be strictly enforced. We've lost a lot of natural environment around the perimeter of the bay as a result of development. We need to hold that line tightly. Um, cumulative impacts of future development must be very carefully considered. Every single new project su sucks up another 1% of the natural habitat in the bay. And every time you look at them and say, oh, 1%, that's not so bad. But you must add the 1% plus 1% plus 1% plus 1% plus 1%. Then you suddenly realize, oh, we've really lost 30% of the bay. And that's not okay. So that's the critical thing to keep your eye on is cumulative impact. Future dredging must be very carefully considered and properly mitigated. I think that is accountable for a lot of the changes in the sediment dynamics in the bay. And uh, we need to be very careful about that. Monitoring of shoreline erosion. Jacques made that point earlier. Previously, a um, lot of effort was put in via the Trust and the Soldana Bay Municipality to monitor rates of erosion along the beaches in Langebaan. That stopped a few years ago. And uh, I think we're going to pay for that if we don't go back and keep an eye on that. Focused monitoring of alien species is very important. Alien species can very quickly get a hold here and change, make dramatic changes to the ecosystem. Some of you might remember many years ago when that alien Mediterranean mussel invaded the lagoon, where the sandbanks were suddenly covered with massive areas of alien mussel. And sand parks invested huge effort on trying to dredge and remove those mussels, and suddenly they disappeared, thankfully. But if they don't disappear, we can see the lagoon changing fundamentally. Bag and size limits for important fish need species need to be reevaluated. We need to protect the popular angling species here so that people can still come and catch fish here. Um, and very importantly, monitoring and assessment of the overall health of the bay and the lagoon must continue. The work that the Trust is doing here is fundamentally important. I'm uh, very passionate about it. I say I've been working for the Trust for many years, but really they do a really fantastic job.
So, thank you. I'm wondering if I should balance this photograph in size and the one end here.